Welcome to Hot Chips 22. The Afternoon Tutorial Optical Interconnect Thank, thank you, Rick. Uh, my name is Ron. I work with Rick at Oracle. It's my honor to present to you a series of speakers today talking about silicon photonics, which I think is a topical and timely uh, discussion point as designers of systems can start thinking about some of the system level trade offs and benefits of using photonics. And if you th look at what I like to call the undereducated press, you know, Slashdot and the like. This topic has gotten a lot of press recently, and generally where there's smoke, there's fire, or at least in this case, light. Because if you think about a photonic link, it's conceptually quite simple, right? At the beginning, we have some sort of light source. It gets shuttered on and off by some sort of modulator, and this on-off light sequence goes down a waveguide, hits a receiver, and becomes a digital signal in electronic form again. Now, this is pretty simple, and in fact, it could be pretty appealing if we can overcome, well, you know, a couple minor points, such as getting the power down substantially below electronic power levels so that it can be useful in that sense. Make sure the overhead is low so we're not burning lots of extra area, for example, or, or complexity, and make sure that the integration costs and yield risks are all manageable. So, you know, a few minor details uh, on, the, on the path, but these could, this could be an interesting tool for designers of systems to think about making the systems run more efficiently with higher performance and so on and so forth. And so we have a little agenda here of speakers to talk to you about some of the efforts going on in the industry. Now, there's a lot of work going on across at various companies. And today, we're not going to see like a comprehensive swath of players because, you know, the work going on at Intel, IBM, Sandia, Cornell, lots of other places, Stanford, and a lot of really good people working in this field. Today, I thought we'd do something more of a introduction of some of the topics and a couple of application studies. So we'll start with an overview of the technology by Jack Cunningham of Oracle. Now, your program actually says Ashok Krishnamurthy, but he had a personal emergency at the last minute, had to cancel, and I'm happy to say that he found one of the few people in the world with a longer resume in photonics than his, also a better looking guy, Jack. Uh, <laughs> he's gonna talk about the technology overview. We'll have Al Davis from Utah and HP talk about photonics in data centers and how you might use that to an advantage. Professor Vladimir Stoyanovich from MIT will be here to talk about photonics and memories. Gil Hendry from Columbia, about to finish his doctorate, will talk about hybrid networks. And then Dr. Frankie Liu from Oracle will talk about some circuit design considerations. So I'd like to start off by asking Jack to come up for the first talk. As I said, Jack has a wealth of experience, over 30 years of experience from Bell Labs to being chief technologist of startups to Sun Microsystems and now to Oracle. He's pioneered a number of world records in various kinds of uh, optical performance uh, of devices as well as packaging, and he'll give a talk about the, uh, the kind of technologies available to us as tools uh, for systems. So without further ado, I'm gonna switch over, I think, to four, here we go. Good, thanks, Ron. Now is, that, is this drive the uh, slides? Uh, that drives the slides, yes. Okay. And uh, did, did we get a laser pointer? Or? Okay. So thanks, Ron. Uh, as Ron said, this is a presentation that Ashok Krishnamurthy uh, was going to give, and he actually um, uh, put together the slide deck. So uh, Ashok uh, uh, is not available, so I'm going to deliver his presentation. Um, and this is a presentation on, on you know, uh, optics, we're trying, uh, it's, it's intended to be an introductory type of uh, presentation where um, we introduce uh, some of the uh, optical components that, that, that have been used in the network and, and 
some of the issues associated with the optical uh, components. And uh, to outline this talk, uh, we're first going to introduce those components through, through uh, uh, definitions, what, what they are, and uh, we're going to look at the historical pr perspective of how optics has penetrated into systems. We at Oracle and, and other uh, teams around the world are very interested in, in bringing optics closer to the processor than ever before. But there's a lot of uh, fundamental barriers that have to be crossed before that happens. So, so we're going to, to try to give this historical perspective and what are the issues associated with bringing optics closer to the processor um, or in, into other uh, uh, systems uh, chips, such as switching chips. Uh, so uh, we would like to show some of the limitations of optics uh, that we have today in terms of the fibers, the connectors, the module packaging, um, and, uh, and you'll see that from how the optical components or modules are segmented. And, um, and from that, we'll, we'll look at three different systems. One, bringing optics um, to the rack. Another one brings optics to the board. And the third one is bringing optics to the chip. And these are real systems that have been built today. And we'll look at those. Um, and, and then uh, we'll go through what are the limitations of bringing optics to the, uh, to the package in the chip. Um, some of the uh, particular things that we'll be looking at are the link en energy per bit, uh, the density of optics, and, and, and the I.O. Uh, those are the three, uh, uh, three problem areas that if we want to bring optics closer to the chip, we have to solve. And one of the solutions that we're exploring is uh, silicon photonics and, and WDM uh, 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 type of uh, uh, multiplexing. Um, and then we'll give some uh, overview of uh, the results that we've achieved for those technologies and, and a brief introduction to a new type of uh, packaging. Thank you, Mark. A new type of... Um, uh, concept, which we call a macrochip. A macrochip is, is one method in which we can do better than Moore's law. And um, when I'll go in, we won't go into the issues of Moore's law, but <clears throat> in, in Oracle's vision, uh, we, we have introduced what we call a macrochip and has both optical and electrical interconnects that um, uh, they can help, uh, help bring uh, higher density to, to systems. And so we'll, we'll look at that. Uh, so some definitions. Um, optical transceivers, these are highly integrated modules that they contain, for instance, uh, uh, laser chips and, receive, and detector chips in which they make a transmitter when they integrate it with a um, driver chip or a receiver when they integrate it with a um, receiver chip. And uh, there's all types of different types of uh, modules that we'll take a look at. Um, generally, these uh, have a fiber input. They're a little, uh, a little module chip that, that you put in fiber, and then they are put down either onto a board or, uh, or put into a rack. <clears throat> and um, the different types of, uh, um, uh, uh, some of the different types of transmitters are um, uh, Vixel based, which allows you to do parallel optics that has, uh, the fiber has, instead of one, uh, one fiber, it has maybe a ribbon of fibers of 12, 24, or 36. So you, you have a lot of lanes that are uh, uh, bringing optical signals down, down a fiber path through, through um, uh, parallel optics. Generally, the parallel optic solutions are consist of VIXELs, and uh, uh, these are surface normal lasers, uh, as opposed to traditional modules uh, that, that have been in, in, uh, in the long haul telecom environment. Those are primarily uh, single mode devices. Um, they're edge emitter lasers and edge emitting uh, detectors, but, but VIXELs, um, um, the VIXELs are surface normal, so they admit uh, vertical to the surface. And 
And the detectors are also surface normal detectors, so you can package them with parallel fibers. And uh, so the, the, that, uh, that makes what we call a parallel optics module. And uh, I just went through the Vixel surface normal technology. It's, it's uh, different than, um, um, than what's um, commercially available for telecom, which is based on edge emitter. Uh, telecom is edge emitter, surface normal, uh, uh, edge emitter. It's um, single mode, Vixels are multi-mode, um, and, and, and edge emitter and, and edge emitters are um, at 1.3 microns and 1.5, whereas Vixels are at 850 nanometers. And so those are some of the differences between uh, what, what makes a Vixel different than traditional components into, into these modules. And finally, there's wavelength division multiplexing. And um, for those uh, who know signaling, uh, there's various types of multiplexing, space division, multiplexing, time division, multiplexing, and um, uh, uh, wave division multiplexing. Uh, wave division multiplexing enables you to put different colors of, uh, of lasers onto one single fiber. And so um, that's how it's got it has its name of, of uh, multiple wavelengths. You can have up to eight wavelengths in coarse WDM. That's where the spacing between the wavelengths is wide enough to avoid complicated packaging. Uh, generally, 20 nanometers uh, is, is the spacing for coarse division, whereas um, uh, dense WDM can have as many as 160 wavelengths. Um, um, now, of course, uh, uh, dense WDM, for instance, uh, has all those 160 wavelengths centered in a, uh, most of them are centered in a band, which we call the C-band, and they're at 1550, where you have access to fibers, and the, the total width of that C-band is, is 30 nanometers. So the, the spacing between all those uh, wavelengths are uh, typically uh, around uh, 100 gigahertz down to 50 gigahertz which is, you know, like 0.5 uh, nanometers. So it's very tight space. So uh, one of the few uh, slides in this talk, I'm, it, it, and, uh, you know, the way I'd like to operate this is if there's any questions, just, you know, um, raise, raise them in the middle of the talk. This is a tutorial. I'm not um, expecting you to wait till the end. So just stop me. Um, and one of the few slides that we're going to talk about is, is, um, is cost. Cost is a very important driver for how optics is penetrated into systems. And so um, uh, the, uh, one of the big issues is uh, always if optics were to replace electronics, how does it do so? One of its metrics has to be the cost. And, and the cost um, uh, of optics is substantially higher. It's been very high uh, for the components in the telecom world. Those, um, those have been as much as uh, thousand, thousands of dollars per gigabit um, because they have to be um, very um, uh, complicated components and they're not easily um, uh, mass produced. So. Um, one of the problems has been in the past is bringing this uh, cost metric down, which is this red curve. And this is based on Vixel-based technology. Um, uh, and and we, we've projected, uh, based on some of the data we had uh, a couple, maybe five years ago, what the, the trends in the cost of optics uh, would be um, projected out. And uh, this is an important uh, value, this is about $2 per gigabit. Um, and systems today are running in Vixel-based systems, optical modules, they're running about a dollar a gigabit today. So this, uh, you know, we projected this five years ago. And um, in fact, it's pretty close to what's, what's going on. At the same time, of course, the, uh, the data rate ha has in increased substantially. Now, that's one of the problems with the optics. Um, is that the cost is still higher. Uh, electrical cost, if you were to put that on this curve, it would be down here somewhere, way down here, 
where it'll be tens of cents per, per gigabit. Um, and optics has always been uh, more expensive uh, until um, elect electrical solutions can't do it. That is, they don't have the reach, uh, the capability to go over uh, a long span to make the, uh, to make the interconnect. Um, and so optics um, costs have been high in the past largely because uh, they don't share the same uh, uh, volume in the marketplace as, as for instance, VLSI uh, silicon electronics. So, and in fact, uh, there's only a handful of optical com companies that make lasers um, and detectors, and and they're they're you know a lot of them are the Japanese. They don't um, uh, until they see uh, substantial volumes, they're not going to be driving these costs down. So these costs have only been driven down by niche market applications. And you know, if there ever becomes volume applications for optics, then you'll see a substantial reduction in the cost. Um, uh, this is a historical perspective of, um, uh, of the um, uh, optical communication and how it's penetrated into uh, various system level things. Uh, these are the uh, tran these are the uh, ultra long haul. They're they're the intercontinental uh, links across, for instance, the United States. They they span 200 kilometers, um, or they go uh, trans oceanic, um, and that's the the span of the link. So it's way down here at the ten tens of kilometer ten. 10,000 kilometers, and that's where optics first made a penetration um, in, into the um, in, into, into systems. So um, the uh, the um, carriers, uh, long distance carriers, first uh, use these uh, components to to build their networks. They've moved, migrated into uh, metro and access. Um, these are like uh, a city in which you would have a ring. Uh, of um, uh, optical, um, uh, is that a question? No, oh, okay. Uh, that this is like a ring going around a city, a trunk, and and, and those are uh, given by you know uh, the components are um, uh, uh, Fabry Pro lasers or or single mode um, um, edge emitting lasers, DFB. Lasers. We'll go into the components in a minute, uh, and then these are local area networks, um, and then, then we start penetrating to the uh, box, into the rack, uh, and finally to the board, and finally to the package of the chip, and and the slope of this line is 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 about 100 gigabits per meter, and uh, this is a complicated graph. It has link distance here. It has aggregate bandwidth here. Um, it has year of introduction here, and it has the cost here and and the number of links here. Uh, the point being that um, all, all these transitions used to be electronic, have now been switched over to optics, except for up here. Uh, and right now we're we're here where optical solutions are are now being used to, to the to the to the uh, to the box and rack, and to the, the to the board. But the slope of this line um, is is an important metric, and it's about 100 gigabits per meter. And here's some of the flavors of different modules: uh, Fabry Pro modules, uh, DFB uh, uh, modules uh, that have direct drive uh, on the on on the lasers. They're directly modulated. The, these are all the single mode solutions. Uh, they're, they're, they're very expensive uh, modules. And here's the reach of these modules. This is long range, intermediate range, short range, very short and ultra short. And now we're, we're trying to penetrate to the, um, uh, to the rack level. And, and there's standards for all these modules um, in either fiber standard or, or um, InfiniBand standards. Uh, these are LEDs. LEDs are not lasers. They, they uh, are sub-laser uh, uh, modules. 
these are the 850 nanometer vixels, um, and here are the parallel optic vixels. And, um, and a special class of these parallel optics vixels are actually what's called active optical cable in which uh, the cable, uh, in, in faces of the cable are still electrical interfaces to the, to the, to the um, um, chassis, but, <coughs> but the signals are, are optical, they're, they're fiber going up to the endpoints. Uh, this is a candidate also for, for silicon photonics. Silicon photonics, again, uh, is, is uh, perceived to be, you know, can it, can it produce high commodity optical components, sort of like CMOS devices, um, uh, electrical devices. Can, can one produce um, optical components in, 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 in silicon photonics? And so uh, we'll take a look at that. So some of the examples uh, uh, of, um, we're gonna now go through some of the examples of optics and, uh, and where it is today. But the, you know, based on those uh, previous charts, there's gonna be three problems in optics uh, that need to be addressed. One is the density. How dense can you bring the optical signals into the, into the box, in, into the rack, or in, into the chip? or um, uh, the I.O., because uh, uh, how, how can you bring a lot of I.O. to, to a chip? And, and the third is, is the power. If, if optics requires so much power to, to just make a link, then it'll never replace anything at the, optic, at the electrical level on the chip. And so uh, we're gonna try to look at those, but. Here's current status today. Uh, this is uh, Oracle's uh, Magnum switch, in which uh, optic, uh, you know, this is an InfiniBand switch in a data center. It's made a lot of headway because it can it can uh, alleviate a lot of the cabling problems in in a in, in a data center. But this uh, uh, Magnum switch uses these so-called active cables. Here's an active cable. This is all fiber. Inside there is a conversion from optics to electrical, and these interfaces are electrical interfaces that plug directly in, into the chassis. Um, uh, you know, in, in this front side chassis, and here's all the interconnects through the fiber, you can get, get up to 50 terabits on the front side uh, of IO access, which equates to about 1.7 terabits per square inch of um, interconnect density. Um, and so there's a lot of these uh, InfiniBand switches. Here's what's been deployed out in the field. Um, this is an example of uh, one, of the, one of the highest uh, you know, uh, IO uh, density into, into the rack today. Um, and a, a different example is the IBM um, supercomputing effort for HPCS. Um, which uses optical modules. And here uh, is an example where you have really the highest I.O. brought into a, uh, into a, uh, a shelf or, or rack. And uh, this, is their, uh, module, this is their rack, which is, consists of 12, 12 drawers. Here's one of the drawers pulled out. There's eight MCMs here. There's eight of them. In each one of those MCMs, there's four P7 chips per multi-chip module. And each uh, P7 chip has eight cores on it. And uh, these, uh, these multi-chip modules talk to their um, switch chips uh, through the electrical backplane in the drawer. Um, and, and where the optical module sits, are interfaced to these switch chips, and these bring the optics from you know from drawer to drawer and from rack to rack, and they consist of these micropods that are put on a, a PCB board. They're actually sitting underneath uh, the switch chips. You can't see them very well, but they are about the size of that dime, and that's how you populate it. Um, for example. 
And so the, you know, um, this is one of the highest uh, IOs to, to, um, uh, to Iraq, 35 terabits. Uh, but it has about, in terms of density, it has about 1.2 terabits per square inch, which is still a little bit smaller than, than the Magnum in terms of interface density. So um, uh, the, the, the problem is that these optical modules are, are really limited by the footprint of the uh, fiber interconnect in terms of density. So these are multi-mode fibers, and there's 12, uh, 12 ribbons there. And so they, they consume a lot of space. They're on a 250 micron pitch. So, you know, so you, you, you're constrained. So an example of where we brought uh, optics directly into the chip is, um, is given in this next slide. And, and this has been a academic story that's, that's worldwide. Here's all some of the uh, references to it. Uh, very similar uh, uh, approaches where you try to bring optics to the chip. Um, and these are based on Vixels. Uh, these are the photo detectors that have been uh, hot integrated to CMOS drivers. And, and you, uh, you, you do a, a, a step where you remove, um, uh, these are three five detectors, you remove the three fives in open space for, for Vixel. This is a Vixel uh, that's in between the uh, detector rows. So you have detectors and Vixels directly hybrid integrated to the chip. And, um, and, and so uh, you can bring a fiber down to each one of these, um, each one of these chips. Um, and so the question is, they're on a 144 micron pitch. So the fiber uh, is maybe one fiber's here, the next fiber's here. And so the closest you can bring the fibers together is about 120 microns or so. And um, uh, this is an example of, of the, the Vixel and, and the detector that have been hybrid integrated together. Um, and this is the fiber array that's been brought down onto that uh, chip, and because they're all, uh, uh, Vixels are multi-mode, they're um, very forgiving in terms of their alignment. You don't have to do a, a lot of uh, uh, hands-on cost uh, consuming packaging to align single mode devices to edge emitting uh, technology. That's what drove the price of, uh, of the optical module so high for, um, for domestic, uh, for for long haul communications. So um, um, this density for, for uh, uh, contrast, the density for this um, technology is, um, uh, uh, let's see. The, uh, the density for this technology is, is Basically, um, I'm going to have to get back on that. I, I, I don't see it here on that slide. But, uh, but the density is uh, about 35 terabits for that um, technology, um, for this technology bringing optics directly onto the chip. And uh, 35 terabits is comparable to um, um, to the, I think I'm uh, missing a slide, that's the problem. I, the, the, it's about 100 terabits for this technology, bringing it directly onto the chip. And it's about um, really uh, an order of magnitude higher than, um, than, than what we get with this 35 terabits of bringing it basically to the, to the rack, to the board. Uh, so what you've overcome is a lot of this fiber interconnect, uh, this fiber uh, coupling has been one of the problems uh, for optics today. And, and that's, you know, some of the uh, issues that we're going to address uh, very shortly. Um, uh, but, uh, and, and how silicon photonics can help that. But there's been another problem in that the, um, uh, the link energy efficiency 
when we look at that, or the energy per bit metric, has always been a problem for optics. And uh, we've plotted this in a, in a new way in which uh, we plot the energy per bit, per, per, or picojoule per bit per meter. That is, it's normalized to the length over which the um, communication has gone. And uh, when you do so, the electrical links really are uh, uh, roughly here, going from you know, a, one, you know, a millimeter up to a meter. Uh, these are where electrical links are today. They're, they're uh, flat on this plot, because um, basically because the capacitance increases per unit length for, for an electrical interconnect. Optics, on the other hand, is basically once you create the optical signal, it doesn't matter how far it goes, it doesn't cost any more energy. So optics has a slope like this, whereas electrical has a slope like that. And uh, the point of that is to try to show you graphically where we need to get to. Um, um, uh, these are where you would have um, um, you know, two picojoules per bit, that, that represents uh, communication from a core to distant memory. 500 picojoules per bit would be a core to L3 cache. And 100 uh, findojoules per bit, this red dotted line would be for, for communication on a core. And the idea is that we would like to get optics, the optical um, um, uh, components or the signaling to get into this uh, region which we call our target. Um, and so here we can start to um, uh, uh, think about bringing optics into the chip if in fact we could reach these um, power targets, these uh, energy per bit. And Ron mentioned that in the, in the beginning. So uh, the technology that we've actually been working on to do that is based on CMOS photonics. Um, and uh, this CMOS, the CMOS photonics is, is commercialized right now by uh, Lextera. And this is an example of their um, uh, optical transceiver. It's based on silicon photonics on a chip. Um, but here is, here's the silicon photonics. Silicon photonics uh, sits um, in this technology node on an SOI platform, silicon on insulator. And here's the uh, transistor technology, you know, gates and source drain and all that stuff. And here's the silicon photonic. Um, this is a modulator in which, um, in which you have uh, uh, doped N and P-like uh, layers. And uh, the point is that silicon is transparent at 1.5 microns, so you can make waveguides, and this is a waveguide. Um, these can be very small, but uh, waveguides because uh, in the fiber, the index change between the core and the cladding was about 1%, and that made the fiber huge. In silicon photonics, this, um, uh, the contrast between silicon and, and box is almost 80%. So you can really shrink down the optical component down less than, than the wavelength of light, down from the wavelength of light is 1.5, so you can shrink it down to, one, to 0.5 microns. So you can really start to make high density optical signals on, on CMOS. And so um, um, the problem is with silicon is that, that it doesn't absorb light. Well, that's great for guiding and transport, but it's very hard to make a modulator. And a modulator, the way it's done in silicon, because silicon is indirect, is you have to break, uh, you have to create a dangling bond, and that produces a, um, uh, uh, a electro-optic coefficient, which is very weak in silicon. Um, and, and the way you do those dangling bonds is you, you, you implant N and P type, and then you apply a bias, and you can then change, modulate the index of refraction. Uh, for um, uh, detector technology, we'll go in that in a little bit. It's based on germanium integrated into this SOI platform. Um, one of the problems we said is that we can't 
with uh, optics, uh, we had a limitation in terms of IO density. And I just want to uh, uh, show you some technology we developed, which is making light in a waveguide on, on a bottom chip coupled to light you know, on the top chip. Um, and we use this uh, uh, facet reflector uh, technology. It's about 20 microns in length. This enables us to get up to um, you know, about 32 terabits per millimeter squared. Uh, so we can bring optical signals uh, on, and, on and off chips uh, easily to 32 terabits. And let's just show you where, remind you where that was again. Here we were getting um, uh, 1.7 terabits uh, per square inch um, and, and, uh, and one point, uh, yeah, around 1.2 terabits per square inch, which is maybe three terabits per square millimeter squared. So this is substantial, uh, you know, a substantial improvement in, in the interconnect density. Um, and so um, uh, this technology enables us to uh, drive signals across the chip at high densities. And, you know, I'm going fast now because I'm running out of time. Um, these are uh, 10 gigabit per second eye diagram. So uh, light is launched from, this is a real package. Light is launched here and, and it communicates uh, on the, it travels on the, on the up chip and then converts over to the down chip and back to the up chip and out through the fiber. And you can um, make a link and it runs at 10 gigabits and there's no, there's no penalties for, for making that work. Now to make modulators, um, that try to drive the modulators to high speed. Um, uh, just for reference, um, before uh, uh, what people did before in, in the CMOS photonics was make mock zenders. I was trying to tell you why the electro-optic coefficient of silicon was so weak. Well, it was weak, and people made uh, mod mock zender modulators, which were like five millimeters on a chip before. So um, that's not going to work in, if we need to bring optics closer to the chip. Uh, it's just way too big. Um, so what we've, we've been working on is, is, is a ring-based technology. These are resonantly enhanced devices in which the light uh, couples into this ring. And this ring, it circulates around that ring maybe 100 times. And every time it circulates, it picks up a little bit of a small index difference because of the very weak electro-optic effect uh, in silicon. But you can modulate signals and, and make a very large, um, large signal modulation out of these small rings. But just to show you, these small rings go up to about 15 gigahertz. This is small signal versus um, uh, frequency. And, and it's up here at 15 gigahertz. These are some of the complex uh, trade-off spaces because, um, as I said, the electro-optic coefficient in silicon is so weak, so, you, so you're trading off bandwidth loss, uh, the depletion length of the device, and the optical confinement. That is, the optical mode has to overlap the PN junction and the depletion width up here. And so there's a big trade-off space, and it's really hard to make those devices um, other than in this window that we show here. And they're very sharp resonance. This is a one picometer and a wide resonance. This is a transmission versus wavelength, one picometer. And so it's very hard to, um, uh, these operate, uh, they're high fidelity, high Q devices. The Q is about 10 to the fourth. And this is the link. Uh, just to show you, this is a transmitter link. Um, and, and the energy per bit for the transmitter is 300, 400 peak, uh, femtojoules per bit. 400 femtojoules per bit, I told you that it was uh, maybe 50 to 100 picojoules per bit based on that technology, this one. And so uh, part of our program has been driving down these energy that per bit. So we've, we've gone down from, from uh, you know, uh, 100 down to 
100 picojoules per bit to less than a picojoule per bit. So, so by making these devices small, we've lowered the energy per bit. But in the process of making them small, there's, um, uh, there's complexity. Uh, this is SOI, and um, what happens is there's a lot of variation. We've, ha we've had to etch the waveguides um, and the thickness of the silicon above the box changes across the wafer. And, and from lot to lot, the, uh, there's CD variations in the processing. And, um, and, and there's uh, differences in the depth of the etches. So all three of these contribute, you know, tens of nanometers of, offset, of wavelength offset to the device. And I said WDM was important because you need to get aligned to an ITU grid. And therefore, if these devices are, you know, running across multiple, multiple or, um, uh, L, multiple neighbors of the ITU grid, you're going to have problems in making a WDM uh, solution. And so uh, what we've done is tried to shift the resonances by applying heat to the device. And the first question, can you integrate heating and modulation in these same rings? And in fact, the, the answer is the eye diagram is unchanged between um, uh, at 12 gigabits between shifting this resonance uh, with, with this heater. Um, some of the other problem is that uh, the efficiency for heating and tuning this and putting it on an ITU grid, a WDM grid, is, um, is, is problematic because, you know, it requires 46 milliwatts of electrical power to actually move the resonance across its its free spectral range. And uh, 46 milliwatts is, um, look how much bigger that is. That's, that's a factor of 100 bigger than, than the power to actually do the optical modulation. So uh, there's a problem in the sense that the, these tuning these things cost a lot of uh, power. And one of the innovations we did was was take these uh, rings and, and etch a, a pit and remove and, and just uh, take out all the silicon substrate under the box. This is all in CMOS. And in fact, we've increased the thermal efficiency by a factor of 20 when we've done that. Um, you can make the receivers um, also by integrating uh, germanium uh, detectors um, and, and you also have a sub picojoule per bit in, in the optical link, and you can measure that with the driver. Uh, one of the complexities of germanium is uh, it requires heteroapitaxy to integrate it to SOI. And that, uh, so you have a lot of defects at the interface. Those drive dark current, and the dark currents can be rather large and limit the ultimate sensitivity that you can get with these detectors, but they're very, uh, that, that's one of their problems, but, but they're very fast devices. And so our vision is to um, uh, have this microchip, and um, this microchip um, uh, takes those uh, components that I showed you, transmitters and receivers and the optical proximity, and, and they actually put them into a two-dimensional planar array of chips. Uh, the, each one of these chips has, has a DRAM, and it has the cores and the optical bridges to, 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 to drive the electrical, uh, optical signals out and, and talk from any one chip to any other chip through some WDM routing network. Now, one of the problems still that, that, that uh, We've built a lot of this uh, optical uh, packaging technology. We can bring it all into alignment with a concept called bone pit packaging. That's a, that's a different talk to go into. But for instance, you, you can have uh, um, you know, uh, eight cores uh, uh, on, on this site, an eight core processor on this site, and this site, and this site, and all talk to each other through this 
optical networking. Um, uh, uh, there's, uh, you know, I'm not. Gonna, I, this is the, the WDM aspect of the optical networking. I'm not going to go into it because I'm out of time. But the, but there is a challenge here. This is a MCM. You've got, you can have up to 10 by 10 array of chips, but and we have the optical networking to communicate to all those chips. But what we don't have is a way to do two things. One is to cool those chips, and to bring power into those chips. And, and in addition, a 10 by 10 array, if, you, if anyone uh, recalls uh, the known good die problem in multi-chip module packaging, the yield would be so low you couldn't make this. And so uh, one of the technologies that we've uh, pioneered with various partners, such as PARC, um, is to make these remateable connections. Uh, these are spring connections. This is the ball and pit packaging that, that I was referring to that lock that, that two-dimensional array of chips together. And, uh, and these springs uh, allow you to make uh, remateable connections. We've tested them. You can bring chips in 10 times and replace them with no degradation and, and resistance. Um, and so um, just to show you, this is our target for, for the, the silicon photonic technology. It's down at, at around less than 200 uh, uh, femtojoules per bit, including all the tuning, all the driver power, and um, uh, to make a, a photo photonic link. Uh, thank you, Ron. Oh, good. Um, well, thank you very much, Jack. I, we're running a little bit late, but if we have one or two questions, we can probably take them if they're quick. Otherwise, I'd encourage you to grab Jack in the hallway afterwards. Any takers? No. Okay, well, thank you very much. Oh, there I'm was sorry, one. Was there a hand? Uh, Maybe you can catch Jack in the hallway yeah, afterwards. Yeah, thanks. But thank you very much. Okay, yeah. Good. Okay, so... It's my pleasure now to introduce uh, Professor Al Davis. Al Davis is at Utah, and he has spent a fair bit of his career at HP Labs as well. Early in his career, he built one of the first data flow machines, if I'm, if I'm correct, also some architectures to do artificial intelligence and various kinds of networking. He has pioneered a lot of interesting work in architecture and systems, and he'd like to talk today about uh, photonics and data centers and how they might help large installations. Let me switch the slides. Hands off, I'm not driving anymore. Yeah, there we go. So this is Dancy, this is Mr. All right, um, now that you know all about devices, let's take a look at what might happen in the data center. Um, most of you hopefully know a little bit about data centers, uh, but you can see the configuration up here, standard. Um, Airflow is to move air from the so-called cold aisles through the hot aisles. Um, there's a bunch of data um, on the slide that we don't really need to go through, but the bottom line is that there's lots of blades, lots of racks, lots of rows, and depending on how it's packaged, um, you end up with um, a fairly substantial amount of computing, but a fairly substantial amount of heat as well. Um, the communication distances in the data center can be relatively small if you have an application that exploits a high degree of locality. But if you take a look at a lot of data center loads um, these days, they're not particularly local. Um, and so you typically have transmission lengths on the order of 100 meters um, order of. Um, as you move between rows or between uh, boards in the same rack, Hello. There we go. Um, the top left figure tends to show up in talks a lot. Um, this is sort of the ugliest version of cabling that one could possibly imagine. Um, and as one might guess, the cabling is actually on the hot row side. And so if you're trying to move a lot of air through that yellow mass there, um, you better blow pretty hard. Um, 
More structured cabling um, certainly exists. Um, a raised floor in a data center costs over a million dollars, so typically power comes up through the floor. There's an increased use of overhead racks. Um, copper cables are extremely heavy. Uh, fiber cables, as you can see, and as Jack mentioned, um, are quite a bit smaller, and this is sort of um, a good thing in a lot of ways. So if we take a look at the switching, there's usually a so-called top of rack switch. Then there's a set of aggregation switches, which you can think of as end of row switches. They're not actually physically in the end of row in all cases. In fact, many, in many cases, they're actually in the middle of the row. And then these rows go through a set of core switches um, that give you the full connectivity that um, you're looking for. And so the problem is, is that the network bandwidth requirement is increasing. Um, data centers are the center of the action. Now that we're all whacked on mobile devices with, uh, Ron was walking around with his iPad, most of you are probably walking around with your iPhone or Crackberry or, or whatever, the computing gets done someplace. All that information that you're getting on your appliance is actually coming out of the data center. Um, so as all of this continually increases with our uh, sort of greed for speed and we always want more, the problem is, is that the network bandwidth in the data center, if you take um, sort of a traditional look at the annual growth rate, combined annual growth rate, or CAGR, you'll see that acronym show up here in a few times, um, it's basically doubling every 18 months. So here's a yet another Moore's Law, um, and in the future we're likely to see on the order of 100,000 sockets where each of those sockets have you know, something like the 8-core P7 uh, that Jack mentioned, and they all still need to communicate. So one of the problems with this um, Moore's Law increase in data center bandwidth is that the core switches um, are becoming increasingly oversubscribed. Now, if you can come up with the embarrassingly parallel always local application, uh, this would mitigate this a lot, but so far that's proven to be a hard problem. Um, so the other issue is that new application loads are placing even more stress on the network. I'm calling them data-centric workloads, of which um, we'll see an example here in a minute. So if we take a look at these top-of-rack, end-of-row um, kinds of switches and take a look at the amount of power that's consumed in these um, switches, certainly there's a lot of power that's consumed in the, the blade servers and the racks and the compute part, but the focus of this talk is certainly on communication, um, and the amount of power that is taken up on the communica communication side is certainly non-negligible. Um, the cost is also non-negligible, and if we take a look at the uh, end of rack and core switches, which are you know, op very often the same thing, you know, big Cisco box, big ProCurve box, big whatever box, um, they're extremely expensive and consume a lot of watts. Um, so, if we move into the HPC space, sort of like the, um, you know, the IBM Blue Gene and successors, the Cray Jaguar and, and successors, their prices and power are even higher because they're typically providing a uh, network topology that has much higher bisects in bandwidth. They're relying on um, pricey ASICs. Um, and in some sense, there's a trickle-down effect. A lot of this stuff on, that's developed on the high-performance computing side has a tendency to trickle down um, into the data center, and that's all good, but the problem of power consumption and heat remains. So Google system monitoring, you've all seen probably the recent publications um, where they're basically tracking in their um, large data warehouses uh, how disks fail, how memories fail. Um, this is not a simple task, right? They've got devices all over the place. They're monitoring each one, bringing this stuff down into their big table in infrastructure, and they use this as a way to understand uh, failure mechanisms and pr uh, provision their data centers in a better way. Wall Street is tracking on the order of 350 billion transactions and updates um, per year at the present time. I don't know what the um, what the growth rate of that is, but the bottom line is these are non-local applications. They're very data-centric. It gets even worse with the proliferation of sensors, right? They're uh, putting wireless moats in the 
uh, forest canopy. There's these ad hoc sensor networks. But at some point, all of this data has to get somewhere and get analyzed to see you know, where, this, where the, all of this extra carbon footprint is coming from, et cetera. So I don't see anything changing here. We're going to move in this direction. So there's MapReduce and the Hadoop uh, model, which is another thing which basically says, OK, we're going to do the map part, and then we're going to do the reduce part. The map part is certainly storage intensive, um, but the reduce part is certainly communication or network intensive. So this is a, um, comes from Google, um, sorting a petabyte with MapReduce on a 4,000 node cluster with 48,000 disks um, has a petabyte of 100 byte records and the sort time, uh, even given this fairly significant um, number of nodes, is six hours and two minutes. So there's a lot of transport that's going on in this particular thing. The thing that is also happening, and it actually makes things worse, is that with the um, continual injection of solid state um, disk technology, some like the IO Fusion guys that are getting rid of the somewhat scummy SATA interface and just putting it on uh, PCI Express um, interface, the current consumption of data center bandwidth is somewhat throttled by the fact that the disks are really slow. So one side effect of bumping the disk speed up is that all of a sudden you're hammering the network that much harder. OK, so if we take a look at um, data center trends, um, 2007 there was about 30 million servers worldwide. The five year forward projection is to see growth um, in servers on the order of 7%. The EPA estimates 17%. I can't actually tell you what the discrepancy is between the industry numbers and the EPA numbers, except that maybe it's government and maybe it didn't account for um, various forms of technology upgrades and server consolidation trends. The fact that we're all whacked on the cloud these days, or at least the companies are, um, is likely an accelerant to this. If we take a look at the storage growth, it's growing at an even faster rate, um, partially because we're creating so much data, what we're doing with it um, varies, of course. Um, and in 2007, we added five exabytes of information. This is the same as uh, 10,000 replications of the entire printed version of the Library of Congress. Um, so it's a significant amount. Um, the internet traffic has certainly gone up. 46% um, uh, forward um, CAGR, which is 6.5 exabytes per month. Um, and that's the equivalent of 650,000 Library of Congress pieces of data being sent every month over the internet. Um, and the number of internet nodes has certainly grown. Um, and this is certainly accelerated by, um, let's say, smarter, um, primarily probably smarter phones. Uh-oh, what happened? I hit the wrong button. OK. so. Challenges with this is that the data center is really, it's consuming too much power. And if the power goes up in um, even a sublinear rate, we're in trouble. It's also uh, generating too much heat, which has to be cooled. Typically, the amount of money that you spend on your capital and the amount of money that you spend on your cooling equipment over the life of that capital acquisition is roughly one to one. Um, and there's a lot of carbon footprint associated that, with that. Um, everybody's into green computing these days, which is why I'm wearing green today. I'm pretending to be into green computing, too. Um, and it's certainly true that we hit petascale computing because in 2006, we consumed 61 petawatt hours of energy, which has doubled since the year 2000. Um, and this doesn't include the telecom component. This is just in the, in the data centers. Um, Four and a half billion dollars in electrical costs. Um, and very often, you get this one-to-one -one mix. The best uh, in terms of uh, cooling costs over the uh, amortized lifetime of the equipment for power. Um, and there's some claims of a 1.2 um, ratio, but that's pretty hard to validate. There are documented versions and published versions that are hitting 1.7, which is certainly good. Um, so one option is to put the data centers in a place where power is cheap and outside air is cold. So there's this really nice quote from PricewaterhouseCoopers that said, Iceland is the great place to put these things. 
right? They've got all this geothermal power. Um, it's nice and cold there, except for we recently had a uh, somewhat event, for, of which this is a picture, uh, that stopped not only uh, air travel to Europe, um, but likely would disrupt some data center um, operations as well. So it's a questionable option. There's a number of drivers uh, that come from the high performance computing side. Um, Kogi and a huge list of authors provided an X scale computing um, study in 2008. Um, and they basically concluded that if all we're doing is simple scaling using uh, today's technology of existing architectures along the sort of projected ITRS roadmap, um, we're going to result in 100 megawatt data centers. And it's likely that the maximum tractable power is, is like one fifth of that. So that's a problem. Um, there's the DARPA UHPC program, which has just gotten started, um, which basically says, hey, we don't want a petaflop in a room. We want a petaflop in a can't in a cabinet. This is very typical DARPA uh, objective, whether it's uh, achievable or not, I think remains to be seen. Um, but the whole idea is that in this one cabinet, you're going to consume 57 kilowatts in order to get this petaflop. This is good. If this really happens, it, it brings things closer together. The heating problem remains. And the grand challenge really is how are we going to achieve these goals um, with big increases in data center um, size, data center performance, data center communication. So if we take a look at the data center network requirements and just focus on that side, um, Jack had some uh, excellent data. But the bottom line, if we take a look at the, just the physical ability to get the data to the card edge, um, the fiber components are better. Cost is not better. Um, there's a little couple of profiles here with both the width and height of a QSFP connector versus a CX4 connector. Um, and if we have higher dimension networks, we're going to reduce the number of hops it takes to get through the various switching in the worst case um, so-called switching diameter of the network. Um, we also want to be able to allow things to grow, right? We want to be able to accommodate scale out to have more racks and rows. We want to be able to do scale up so that we can actually integrate um, higher performance um, blades in this case. Um, certainly regularity is going to be important. You can take advantages of that in routing algorithms. We want to minimize the cable complexity and bulk. Um, we want to ideally minimize, as a manufacturer, you really don't want a lot of SKUs. These are the part number um, SKUs, where if you say, well, I need 50,000 cables and each one of them is a different length. This is not a wonderful place to be in. You're much better off having a few cable sizes and you know, 50,000 of one type and maybe 50,000 of another type is much better. Um, so one of the things that um, we at HP have been investigating is the use of optics in high radix routers, um, which is both in support of higher dimensional uh, networks um, and also to contain costs. And the idea is, is that the bandwidth per port is going to scale over time, um, well, should scale over time in order for us to be able to provision our networks to meet the, um, the increased demand. OK, you're not supposed to read any of the details here. This is just an eye chart. This is the ITRS for interconnect. And presumably, most of the people in this room are familiar with the ITRS. But if you're not, red means no known solution. Yellow means something's in the lab, and it might work, but we're not sure yet. And white says, hey, we got it. Well, we're right in here. Right? We're running out of yellow, and we're running into the red lights. And this is all of the copper um, interconnect. And so this motivates us to look towards photonics, which obviously is the topic of this session. Um, so I think Jack covered it pretty well, and I'll try and minimize the amount of, of overlap. Um, but the problems with signaling in copper is that both power and delay fundamentally increase with length because of capacitive issues. OK, I can improve the delay thing by optimally repeating stuff. And if you want to know more than their, if you they want an excellent reference, I'm not just plugging the session chairman, but Ron Ho's thesis is worth reading. 
It's worth keeping on your desk, as a matter of fact. Um, signal integrity problems exist at all length scales. We're having signal integrity problems on the chip. We certainly have high-speed signaling, you know, so-called CERTES units, uh, serial de deserialized high-speed links like 10 gig. Um, signal integrity there is evil, and it gets worse um, the longer the run. Um, most of our systems have been heavily optimized for electronics. Duh, why wouldn't you? Because that's the technology of choice. Um, and signal integrity is a problem. So, and so things where buses might work, they've disappeared a long time ago, except possibly with DRAM. Now, you think of the DIMMs on a channel kind of being on a bus in the sort of fully buffered DIMM with the A and B ASIC on each DIMM. It's really um, a daisy chain um, sort of arrangement. But the bottom line is that those kinds of structures on chip, unless they're heavily localized, really don't work out too well because of signal integrity issues. Um, another problem is that the ITRS projection, and of course the ITRS is just a projection. Um, it's interesting to look at 2008, what we had in 2008 or 2009 or now in 2010, and see what the ITRS projected five years ago. It's different. Um, but the projection is, is that the per pin bandwidth is going to grow very slowly, and the number of pins that we're going to get on a chip is going to grow very slowly. So from a high radix router perspective, you have a choice. I can have lots of really slow ports, or I can have a few really fast ports. Right? And this is not necessarily the trade-off that you want. What you ideally want is, well, you want everything, right? You want lots of very fast ports, and this is going to be a problem. The advantages are obvious. It's a mature technology. Jack mentioned many of the immaturity issues. Um, I like that three-axis graph that talked about the XY variation, the Z variation, um, and how slight differences in that cause um, the resonance properties of the rings. Um, to be quite different. Um, and so it's a less mature technology. Electronics is great. Uh, we know how to manufacture it. We know how to package it. The NRE has been amortized. There's all this infrastructure in place um, to make it work for us. The question is, how long? There's a great Texas proverb that says, always ride your horse in the direction it's going. Um, but given the ITRSI chart, one wonders when it's time to pick another horse that's headed in a slightly different direction. So the case that I'm going to try and make today is that we're nearing the time when we need to look at a different option, in this case photonics. Um, and the bottom line is that the computation side gets better with technology improvements. You know, we see this in the um, feature size. As the feature size of the transistors get down, they consume less power, they go faster. Things get smaller for, let's say, the size of a floating point unit. That's all nice. The problem is, is that the size of the chip is staying roughly the same. And the focus of my presentation today is that the size of the data center is pretty much staying the same, too. So those long distance communication issues are problematic. Um, so if we take a look at some re recent CERTES publications, um, there is no roadmap that I have seen for for CERTES, but they're certainly come in two flavors. One I'll call short reach, which is really CERTES to something on the board close by, like maybe memory modules. Um, and then there's long reach, which are set up for more distant communication. And they're certainly not transatlantic. Um, they're on the order of maybe 10 meters or so. Um, and if you take a look at um, the transmit power, the receive power, the clock, um, power, you can see what the numbers are here. But if we take a look at the percentage improvement, just from the Rambus to Hitachi three years later publication, you can see that the output is power consumption has actually gotten better, but nowhere near at the rate of the stuff that's actually on the die itself. Right? So what we're seeing is output power being relatively um, the same, I mean, it does get better, but slowly. And things that are on the chip that are actually generating the modulation and all that kind of stuff um, are getting better at, you know, Moore's law-ish kind of rates. That's all good. 
Problem is, is that if this continues, then the output power starts to um, dominate the total power of the chip. Okay, photonic signaling, the problems are, it's, I mean, it's not an immature technology in that the, there are not like hundreds of people doing really good work. But with respect to deploying it in the marketplace, it's an immature technology. Jack mentioned many of the uh, issues. Certainly, all of the components have been built. People have built waveguides, multiple kinds, um, detectors that in various forms, um, and modulators. And we expect improvements in all of these things. People are using slightly different things. Sandy is using disks. Uh, the, the rings that Jack was talking about were depletion um, structures at HP. We're actually using um, injection structures. Um, who's the winner? I'm not the right guy to say, um, since my optical physics left, well, most of the progress in my optical physics stopped in 1969 when I left MIT. Um, that was probably before a lot of you were born. Um, so the other issue um, is that the optical structures themselves don't scale with technology, right? The properties of those rings, they're proportional to the frequency of light that you're using, and the sizes of the devices have to be sized properly and with the appropriate control so that you have the channel spacing um, that can be maintained. The other issue is this thermal tuning issue. We tend to, at least at the devices we use, we redshift them um, thermally with the heaters. We bring them back in and out of resonance for modulation with charge injection. That can be done very fast. But heating things up instantly and cooling it down instantly is not very fast. So there's, there's a huge number of issues that um, people need to deal with. There have been some proposals for athermal rings. I personally hope they succeed. Um, I would love it if we didn't need heaters, but I don't actually, I haven't seen them yet. Um, the advantages are obvious. For the lengths of interest that we care about, the energy in the, in the photonic links is consumed at the endpoints. So I consume energy when I do a electrical to optical translation and from an optical to electrical translation. And the losses in the waveguides and the connectors are actually pretty darn good and fixed. So for the lengths of interest, we, things aren't too bad. The other advantage is that they're relatively immune to signal integrity problems. It's not like you can't get optical interference. You can. Um, but they're not as severe as they are with electrical signaling. Um, and assuming that you move forward in the wave division multiplexing from single mode, you know, eight mode CWDM, greater than eight mode um, for uh, DWDM, yeah. we're going to toggle this thing at pretty much the same rate, let's say, if we, if we constrain our signals to, let's say, 10 gigabits per uh, per second per lambda, the lambda, the number of, of frequencies in your WDM um, spectrum is the multiplier. That's good. Um, what the limit is, Jack mentioned 160, uh, the Infinera stuff that is used in telecom, which is based on Indian phosphide devices, um, supports 160 wavelengths. Um, the stuff that we are using at HP, where we're basically doing five micron rings, we think 64 lambdas is doable in time, assuming that we can manufacture these things in um, a reliable uh, way and keep them tuned. Um, the free spectral range of the rings actually goes up as we make the ring smaller, but variations in the processing um, that were mentioned in the previous talk cause these small rings to be less, more sensitive um, to uh, fabrication variations. Um, the one thing that nobody is claiming in the optics field is the common misconception that you get in the uninformed press, I think, as Ron called it, which is that light in a waveguide is faster than electrons in a good wire. That's complete BS. There might be a minuscule advantage or a minuscule disadvantage, but for all intents and purposes, just view latency as the same. What we're talking about is primarily a potential power advantage and a potential bandwidth advantage per um, lane. Okay, so an example of a <coughs> excuse me, 
a DWDM point-to-point -point link is shown using an external laser source, some number of rings, in this case there's 33, indicating that there's 32 data lambdas and an associated um, source strobe that is act, uh, acting as the clock. Um, goes through Silicon Ridge Waveguide. Um, the loss is actually quite small, 0.1, 0.3, 2.3 uh, dB per centimeter in silicon. These things have been demonstrated by several groups. Um, there's some loss at the splitters that laser is just a power uh, thing which is distributed through a bi essentially a binary tree to whatever set of, of lanes um, you might have. Go off into a single mode fiber through a coupler. The loss there is anywhere from 1 dB at the best um, case to on the order of 3 dBs for kind of a crappy connector. Um, and off to some set of um, detectors on the receive side. So if we take a look at the optical losses, we see that the waveguide is not much loss. There's not much loss um, in the modulation itself. We're just basically slurping the light off or letting it go on by to encode the signal. Um, the fiber couplers are um, actually the biggest source of loss. Um, and then there's laser coupling and distribution where there's some, some loss as well. But the bottom line is the total amount of loss is not particularly high, which is a nice property. Um, if we take a look at um, 10 gigabits per second um, in a 32 nanometer process, granted the numbers that you see here, I wouldn't take them to the bank. I don't take them to the bank. Um, these are best case numbers that we've been able to pick up in the literature, some of which we have been able to replicate, some of which we have not. Right? But the bottom line is that um, Jack was hoping to get to about 20 or so femtojoules per bit um, we're still a factor of five away from that um, in order to compete with electronics, assuming that the other problems of electronics don't actually hit and kill us first. Um, but the important thing to note is that 60 femtojoules per bit of tuning power gets consumed whether you're using the link or not. Right? All of those structures need to be kept in their little parking space um, continually, otherwise they will start to interfere um, or create much higher losses to, let's say, the adjacent lambdas um, that are being active. Okay, if we take a look at um, the Mellanox InfiniSwitch, which is sort of a state-of-the-art thing, 36 ports at 40 gigs, or you can sort of mux them together and get uh, 12 ports at 120 gigs. Um, basically 10 gigabits per second for each differential pair. 576 signal pins, consumes 90 watts, 30% of which is I.O. Um, so, the problems. The, both the port count and the I.O. bandwidth is sort of in this catch-22 of having more skinny ports or less higher bandwidth ports. Um, it also requires additional external transceivers needed to drive uh, on the order of part of a meter of FR4 or a six, mil, uh, six meter cable um, and the signal integrity and EMI issues um, are becoming increasingly severe as we try and speed these things up. So I think the improvement in the data center is use optical cables. This is already in somewhat limited use. Um, the active cables are certainly here. Um, the next is to move optics into the core switch backplane, um, maybe even an all passive backplane where you just get things to the right waveguide. Um, this can be done with Vixel technology in various forms of optical backplane. It doesn't have to be fiber. Um, there are other waveguides such as um, various even plastic um, waveguides that have, that have been demonstrated in several different labs. Um, the ability to increase the backplane bandwidth in the core switches, which are increasingly oversubscribed, as I mentioned before, is a really attractive feature. And if you don't have to change the backplane, but you do change the thing that you plug into the backplane, um, and then just run more lambdas, that's a very attractive feature. It is not a totally trivial thing to do. Um, the next step is to go to the high rate 
router with getting the photonics to the edge um, of the chip. Um, and in this case, you know, you can benefit from the DWDM style bandwidth. On the other hand, it's a big technology jump from a laboratory demonstration of a single device to something that is vended, right? Manufactured reliably at low cost. Um, and, you know, it, wouldn't it be a bummer if nine out of 10 boxes that you deliver your customer are DOA, right? And you have to send out your pile of engineers. Um, I think in the early days of IBM, we got three different IBM systems that were DOA on arrival at, at the place I was working. Um, but, you know, you can't get away with that crap now. So the last step is basically um, to employ a, a strictly a photonic switch where we're actually bringing photonics onto the chip. Um, so here's what I'd like to be the timeline. It varies a little bit from um, what Jack's projection was. But active cables are here now on the order of 100 p hundreds of picojoules per bit. Um, optical bus in back planes of devices um, uh, does exist. Um, um, Bowers at UC Santa Barbara has developed an interesting hybrid laser cable um, where we've got a 3 pi compound stacked on top of a ring. Um, the silicon photonic rings um, are demonstrated in onesies in the lab in various places. And moving to a whole um, optical crossbar, we did a um, paper a few years ago um, in ISCA on a system called Corona. Very, very futuristic look with very, very futuristic um, assumptions, some of which we have subsequently disproved, which is kind of annoying. Um, so that 10 years might actually stretch out a little bit. But I think the point is, is that um, this stuff is coming, and it is getting better, and the question is the rate. So one example of a passive optical backplane is to use semi-silvered mirrors so that each detector gets the same amount of photons with namely the sensitivity um, of the detector so that they're all the same. And everybody has one transmit port and everybody has N receive ports. Um, and in this case, it's even sending to itself for a loopback um, kind of stuff. This technology exists and it um, has been built. Um, and we've seen on the order of 30% uh, power decrease due to the better interconnect. Um, it's based on Vixel technology, which Jack described. Um, and Luxterra today is doing four Lambda um, CWDM uh, devices. And the nice thing is, is that when you move from one Lambda to two Lambda to four Lambda, the backplane doesn't need to change. What you plug into it does change. Um, the next step would be moving to um, switching structures that involve resonance rings on the chip. Um, and moving from sort of 64 to 128 DWDM ports for a single switch chip, given the periphery and the interconnect density appears to be feasible. Um, it's not necessarily feasibly buildable today, um, but based on mechanical constraints, that's feasible. Um, the nice thing is, is that the switch size is unconstrained by sort of fundamental mechanical issues. Um, we get the bandwidth scaling due to increasing um, the number of lambdas, and we have a greatly increased connector density and reduced cable bulk. The whole idea of this is to minimize the electronics to the small portion of the switch chip where you actually have to have electronics. I have to buffer the thing, I have to inspect the packet header, I have to perform a routing decision. Um, whether I have an output buffer or not remains, but if I want to do things like link level retry, I'll probably need an output buffer, um, and the rest is just optics. So this is the this is my dream. Um, may not be your dream, but it's mine. Um, the question is, when can we achieve this? We did a study based on best of breed numbers. So these are, these are highly optimistic, um, where we said, OK, what are the steps? Let's bring optics to the I.O. ports of the switch and do everything electrical inside. Then let's bring optics into the core, where we'll do optical arbitration as well as optical switching of the data inside the core. Um, and somewhat unfairly, we base the um, electrical I.O. and electrical core um, on the cray Yark chip, which is sort of best of breed um, in the HPC world at the moment. But the cray Yark chip was actually built in a slightly different set of, uh, a slightly different optimization, slightly different, way different optimization point 
from what we were doing. We were thinking, hey, you know, everybody's all whacked on Ethernet. Let's do Ethernet. Go anywhere from the 64-byte packet to the Jumbo 9180. And that becomes our FLIT, or flow control unit, whereas the Cray Yark is optimized for very, very small um, flow control units. And hence, the buffering and the way the, um, the microarchitecture works. This paints a little bit of an unfair picture um, towards the Yark. But you can see the numbers. There's basically a huge um, gain. Oh, and we're also saying that in the 45 nanometer, we can do 8 lambdas. In 35, we can do 16 in 22 nanometers. So at every step, we get a, a doubling in the number of lambdas. Um, that seems to be feasible. Um, well, we claim it's feasible in this study. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and you can see basically that there's a huge advantage if you can just bring optics to the chip. There's another advantage of bringing optics to the core. This is a much harder technology to control, I believe. Um, but you see the numbers. So. We employed this in a uh, network topology we call HyperX. The HyperX idea is really simple. It says, I have an n-dimensional network. Each dimension, within each dimension, we have a full interconnect. And then as I go to the next dimension, I basically mirror that first dimension. And everybody has a connection to its mirror. Right? So, Dimensions can be arbitrarily shuffled, so in any one dimension I have a full interconnect. Right? And so here you can see a two-level, on the top figure, you see a two-level thing where this structure, fully connected, is replicated in the second dimension. In this case, we have one of these guys, which has three members in that dimension, and then three members in the other dimension as well with the full interconnect. It's highly regular and we've come up with a pretty nice search uh, procedure that allows us to say, hey, we can tailor this to whatever the package looks like. So if we start out with a collection of these devices sitting on the, on the board and move to the next step, which, you know, the high dimensions reduces the hop count, um, and we move to the next step and say, oh, the next step in the package is this. We do the same thing. And then what we can do is basically package this super high rate switch in a way where we export a certain number of cables in each of the three dimensions, which is the example shown here. And then we do this again in the data center, and it's all nice and regular. The cable structure is extremely regular. Um, and this is a pretty attractive option. Okay, so. The general conclusions are, there's no doubt that advances in the electronic technology is going to continue. They are the competition. And if photonics is going to come on board, we're going to have to beat them somehow. Um, certainly the processing side will benefit from all of this. Um, the data center communication part will not benefit as much. Um, in an ideal world, the optics would be the transport choice. Most of us might have noticed that we don't live in an ideal world. Um, and there's no question that a complete change to optics is not going to happen overnight. It's not like somebody's going to turn a switch and say, oh, gee, everything's optics now. It'll happen in small steps, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that has to happen. Industry, you can't underestimate industry momentum. There's a huge amount of stuff that's gone on that cost a fortune, and we're going to milk it for everything it's worth. I remember having in the year 2000 when I was working at Intel on a project called Tejas, uh, with the guy who was head of the Intel Microprocessor Group, named Albert Yu, um, about, geez, maybe we should think of the non-monocore solution. Well, Kunli at Stanford had articulated the so-called CMP four years prior to that in a DARPA meeting, and I thought he had a pretty compelling argument. Four years after the argument with Albert Yu, Intel cancels Tejas. So, the bottom line is, is that from the research lab to the, let's say, industrial practice takes a long time. Powerwall's here to stay. It's not going to go away. Um, and I think the definition of long, oops. OK, the definition of long shouldn't be measured with a ruler, right? What we thought of as long-distance communication 10 years ago 
because of signal integrity issues, has gotten a lot shorter. Maybe we should measure long in terms of the time it takes a transistor switching speed to trans traverse you know, such and such a length. And if that's the case, I think the pressure <coughs> is clearly ramping up. OK, so I personally believe the switch to photonics is inevitable. Um, and I really hope it's not the case of photonics as a promising technology always was and always will be. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I'm just on the tail end of coal. Bottom line is the technology exists. It's not mature enough yet. Um, and the real barrier, and I totally concur with Jack, um, is cost. You know, inside HP, we, they say, yeah, we want all these photonic advantages, and they better not cost one cent more than the electronics that we're using now. So this is a challenge, and it's going to take a while. Um, the catch-22 is price has a lot to do with volume. If the volume isn't there, you can't get with the, the investment in the high-end fabs and all the mass costs and everything else. Um, and it remains to be seen when the problems get rigid enough so that you just have to bite the bullet. All right, that's it for today. This was done with a bunch of people at HP. They're in your slide handouts. I referred almost like a publication to various papers, uh, and there's a bibliography. Thanks. We have time for maybe one or two questions. Okay, well, you can catch up with Al in the hallway. Thank you very much again. Our next speaker is Professor Vladimir Stjanovich, who is at MIT as a professor in electrical engineering. He got his degrees from Stanford as well as from the University of Belgrade in Serbia. So he works on a number of high-speed interconnection issues, mixed signal circuit design. He spent a couple years at Rambus and brings to the table a lot of history in serial link designs. He's also one of the smartest guys I know. So Vladimir, please take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank Jack and Al for uh, sort of the device and uh, introduction, as well as sort of the, the, the big range issues that photonics has to do in the data center. I'd like to focus more on sort of the, the smallest uh, distance we have to uh, conquer in order to get the photonics in the box. And that's really talking between processor and the memories. And uh, of course, I uh, have to thank first uh, a whole bunch of collaborators that made this work and results possible, especially uh, so both the, the architecture people as well as device and circuits people who were uh, working actively on this at MIT and now also Berkeley, uh, Boulder, Cornell, and Boston University, as well as the, the sponsors. So really, um, you know, we've all, all witnessed across uh, sort of 10 years now even that the system designers have moved from sort of instructional level parallelism to mining data level and thread level parallelism in order to overcome the slowdown in technology scaling. And uh, last year at ISCC, we've seen uh, examples of 48 core Xeons. So um, the scaling has gotten such that we can afford from the area and density standpoint to have uh, dozens uh, of cores if in a couple of years, even hundreds of uh, medium-sized cores on a uh, radical size uh, socket. The problem with that uh, is that these cores both burn power, and we're not quite sure that the energy efficiency, of course, is going to get us down so we can actually uh, keep them all active, which is one issue that has been mentioned uh, previously, uh, that there are efforts like UHPC to try to address that. But that aside, these also cores also need to munch some data. And if we look, take a look at all cores being active, we're, we're saying that uh, you know, they could run and create a demand for up to two to five teraflops of uh, processing, which means that to keep them happy and uh, crunching data not only in place, we need about five to 10 terabits, uh, terabytes per second of uh, communication between the memory and the processors. Now, if we do a little MATLAB exercise of sort of plotting the trends, and if, if we want to keep scaling from sort of from uh, 2007, 8, both on the mobile client and the sort of the server HPC, just uh, doubling the number of cores every uh, three years or so, what we basically see is that, uh, you know, that's where the teraflops demands come from. 
Uh, we see that these teraflops demand essentially one byte per flop. Some people may argue that's too much for certain applications. There are applications that demand 10 bytes per flop. So this is kind of a, a ballpark figure. Uh, as mentioned before, we have this, this major problem that the IO energy efficiency is not scaling as fast as we would like to. And if we just looked at the single link, uh, people here at Stanford, as well as uh, part of myself when I put the, my electrical hat on, uh, would tell you that hey, it's possible to get that energy even way lower, but not by simultaneously increasing the data rate as well. So we're right in this box where bandwidth density and energy efficiency are really constraining us. Here I'm talking about this scaling for roughly 10 gigabit per second type links. And if you keep sort of the 10 gigabit per second rate, what happens is that uh, you pretty much get this type of uh, limit on the number of pins that you need to supply roughly a two teraflops worth of performance to the machine. Uh, if you look at scaling these flops through this uh, picojoules per bit cost, you see that roughly in three, four years we're already out of, ban out of bandwidth. IO burns the power as much as it's dedicated to the whole socket, not only to uh, not the processor and the, the, the IO. So, an even bigger problem is here that if we really wanted to sustain this performance and we even had very low energy cost per bit, we would still need to somehow come up with 16K signals into the high speeds, uh, uh, into the sockets of the processor. We know that two thirds of the signals now are for power delivery. And this is sort of the ITRS projection of how sockets will develop in terms of the number of pins. So we're way uh, above that requirement. Uh, just to give you a little bit more concrete example, if we really try to build this system, sort of a board with about half a terabyte of data and about um, 10 teraflops performance sustained, uh, somewhere between 64 and 256 tiles uh, on the socket, even if you use medium-sized cores that are relatively optimized today, they would be about 100 picojoules per flop. So the big and valid question is, fitting 10 teraflops in, would be about one kilowatt for compute on sort of link pack type of uh, uh, benchmark. So not even communicating. Um, that obviously can happen, because we have a socket requirement of about 130 watts or so, 150. Uh, so, and there, the UHPC effort to NARPA has been mentioned. There's other efforts that are geared toward improving that performance. And we can sort of rely a little bit on scaling, but not that much to bring us down here. But if we assume that uh, some microarchitectural and architectural efforts can improve the core efficiency um, to 10 picojoules per flop, which are sort of these targets for the UHPC programs. Then we're stuck with sort of the cross chip and the IO issue on the processor side. Uh, we also are stuck with, as I mentioned, with sort of the signaling density uh, of, that's required to supply these 10 teraflops. But another thing that hasn't been mentioned sort of in the context of the board itself or, the, or that embedded system or a blade uh, in, a, in a rack is that the memory subsystem burns sort of an equivalent amount of power. Now, for 10 teleforms performance, we see that this is roughly balanced. But if the, if the processor itself improves, then there's a big incentive and the need to basically improve the memory side as well so we can uh, sort of satisfy the Amdahl's law and scale the system very efficiently. Now, uh, in the, on the memory side, we have sort of similar and sort of di different memory modeling tools basically give you diff a little bit different answers, but typically this is the breakdown between the activate IO and the cross-chip energy on the, on, the, on the DRM. So because we're in this energy, uh, cost and bandwidth density box essentially moving forward, assuming processors can scale their own core performance. We really need to improve the interconnect in the whole box. And what we've seen as, as a solution, as well as like many other teams uh, trying to, to work on this, is basically using silicon photonics. But then when you, when you look at different teams doing uh, things, everybody has sort of a different approach. Uh, at MIT, we have focused, uh, we sort of acknowledge that if we don't make the photonic device be treated exactly the same as the transistor, meaning that it's in the same process being developed at the same process development rate as the transistor, we won't be able to make these moves and to basically bring the cost down. But that's not the only reason. That's sort of the introduction. 
But the benefits to this monolithic type of integration is that we significantly reduce any types of parasitics between the transistor and the photonic device. So we can get really good energy efficiency, and we can get as good as possible uh, bandwidth density in, uh, with very dense wavelength division multiplexing. Now, uh, I'm not going to show you sort of details of the photonic technology uh, too much in this talk. I have, do have a couple of backup slides that I can show, but at MIT a couple of years ago, we looked at widespread use of, of monolithic silicon photonics. So we, we said most of the technology really relies on uh, silicon and insulator, and actually rather old silicon insulator technology. We're talking about 130 nanometers, where barrier oxide is very thick to provide isolation from silicon, which has some very subtle issues if you try to use that on a high performance 45, 32 nanometer transistor. In fact, it won't work. Uh, so we've tried to do this for bulk, which is a ma mainstream technology, but also applies to very thin barrier oxide uh, SOI. And uh, Jack has already mentioned sort of this undercut thing we sort of focused on that from the get-go because it enabled us to sort of um, minimize the optical losses, but the, a very nice side effect, as mentioned previously, was that your thermal tuning uh, actually gets really, really e efficient and brings you in the ballpark where you can start believing in this technology. Uh, so here's a little cartoon of, of that link where we have the off-chip laser because lasers are, uh, silicon lasers are pretty inefficient. Uh, we couple into the the chip through grading couplers, funnel into signal mode, the sort of waveguide mode, about half a micron wide waveguides, uh, go next to the ring modulator structure, modulate the light, and basically couple out and into another chip. So it's a pr pretty generic um, silicon photonic link with this caveat that we're really in the same process. This driver here sits right next, like a couple of microns, 10 microns away or so from the, the actual device. So you use the transistor front end to basically build in the photon device, similar to what uh, Jack showed earlier. But this is either in a bulk or thin box SOI. So once you sort of look at the size and the, the properties of the photonic devices, you can sort of get this kind of comparison in energy per bit and bandwidth density between the uh, electrical and uh, photonic technologies. Uh, photonics doesn't cost you that much, somewhere between 100 and 250 femtojoules per bit, depends who projects. Um, regardless of sort of the, the distance. Coupler costs you a little bit more extra power, but um, that's not that uh, important uh, until you get to very large number of uh, chips you want to couple into, like I'm going to show later. And uh, so pretty much cross-chip or immediately outside the chip, the, co the energy cost is the same. You're about four to five times better than a medium-sized repeated wire on a chip which is not a huge advantage if you think a little bit about it. Um, so I would put off just the on-chip communication for like very, di very distant future. Uh, but you get some pretty big benefit immediately just for removing the, the, the IO. Uh, the an interesting point for both the on-chip and off-chip is the uh, tremendous bandwidth uh, density advantage. Yes, it was mentioned that photonic uh, devices are big because they depend on the wavelength. But you can actually put a lot of wavelengths in that one half a micron waveguide with four micron pitch. So actually, uh, your bandwidth density is quite a bit bigger than even uh, repeated on-chip interconnects. Yes, you can use many layers, but you don't have 100 layers, uh, uh, metal layers to, to route. Similarly, uh, if we look at sort of the, the off-chip, uh, we, can, we can do a couple of pitches at about 100 micron. And so we can get about, six, about 60, 30 to 60 times, maybe even 100 times better bandwidth density than electrical I.O. with sort of C4 type bumps and 10 gigabits per second per bump. Uh, this, of course, assumes that we really go to the extreme of about 64 to 128 uh, lambdas, or about a terabit per second per that waveguide that routes. Now, we got to be careful a little bit uh, about this picojoules per bit cost, because people often just cite that number. But in the network context, it's very important what's the breakdown. Uh, as was mentioned previously, uh, some of these energy components actually have static power, originate from static power, some from the dynamic power. And really, in the network context, depends what is your link utilization. Some links can be very unutilized 
in the system, and therefore that static piece now just blows up in terms of the, your equivalent femtojoules or picojoules per bit. So if we look at the electrical, uh, we have sort of shown here a, a rough breakdown for, similar to what Al had in the tables for about uh, five picojoules per bit cost, and sort of the aggressive and, and sort of a little bit more conservative photonic projections. But even with these very efficient tuning uh, that I mentioned with the undercut, you can see that you know, sort of the tuning cost is pretty visible. I, and I'm showing here 100% utilization on the link. So now you can imagine that this link is nominally 20 to 30% utilized. This red piece becomes a much bigger chunk of the overall energy budget. So we really need to, uh, from the system standpoint, think how to build photonic networks in between chips, on the chip, so that we can make these links fully utilized. Now, just to give you a sort of a baseline electrical architecture to which we're going to compare some of the examples that I show, is as I shown, typically you can have an on-chip mesh network where the cores are sort of interconnected or the tiles are interconnected and you, you can have gang two, co four cores or a single core per router. Those are sort of architectural decisions. But among these routers, there are also interspersed memory controllers or access, memory access points, uh, so to speak. So each core will have to traverse this on-chip electrical network to get to appropriate access point, and then that is mapped to a certain uh, chunk of memory, and then hit the I.O. link to get out. Now, both this cross-chip and off-chip are pretty costly, especially in, in, in the meshes, which if they try to sustain large bandwidth, they basically, the number of wires and the, the width of the channels in the mesh actually increase pretty significantly. So one of the ways, if, if, we, if we could have cheap I.O., one of the ways to minimize this interconnection or, or travel across the chip would be to limit the length by which any core has to communicate with the memory, embedded memory controller. So that means that we, we create two groups here. So there's a group zero and group one. Core in group zero never crosses this half of the chip. There is a, a memory, let's say if we, if we take a look at this memory controller, a core will go down to the blue and exit uh, here, and then in the lower part, core will have to hit this memory controller and exit uh, into there. So it doesn't have to cross uh, go all the way across the mesh in order to reach the destination. Now, of course, since we have now two requests to the same memory module, we have to have some sort of a buffer chip or an arbiter to basically decide who gets the channel. Now, notice this works only if this I.O. is very cheap, because we can replicate it, both in terms of the bandwidth density as well as the energy cost. Especially if we can have that I.O. effectively traverse across the chip with not significant uh, energy cost. So silicon photonics gives you just that. And so, but you have to be care very careful how you map it to the physical implementation. Otherwise, you start running into the issues that, that physical mapping introduces so much optical loss or such number of photonic devices that tuning uh, costs are also prohibitive, as acknowledged by the, sort of the previous speaker in some of the the early photonic evaluations. I'm going to show that we also, although we erred towards photonic simplicity, we also had our own um, cases like that, that uh, sort of the later case significantly optimizes what the previous idea was. So I just wanted to show a, sort of an updated version of the, of the physical mapping, where uh, a light comes in, it goes to this group, uh, one group of uh, six, about 16 cores, uh, gets modulated, comes out, gets all the way to the, to the dedicated memory module, and uh, another group of cores here can independently get modulated to the same memory module. Now, the key thing to notice here is that each one of these groups basically has a dedicated channel. It's a dedicated, say, let's say, 16 wavelengths from the group to the memory module. That light is always on. So you better have enough diversity in traffic in that one group to basically fill that pipe. Otherwise, that static energy component just blows up. And so there's a sweet spot. We could put like 32 or 64 cores in one group. So there's basically a sweet spot of sort of 16 cores that statistically for different types of traffic will give you enough uh, of saturation on that one 
uh, link to keep it basically uh, pretty busy all the time. If you go to fewer cores per group, you start running into diminishing return. So with this type of architecture, you essentially have uh, not that many rings and modulators in the whole network, uh, and which results in sort of reasonable thermal tuning costs. We have essentially uh, 16,000 rings. Uh, just to compare, Corona architecture had about a million rings in, in the earliest uh, sort of implementation. And so this is, uh, but the, the, this is provided basically by the simplicity. These are actually just point-to-point -point links with uh, a whole bunch of rings busted on them. Uh, it's very important for architects to start thinking when they're architecting this system and doing physical mapping to basically go and notice the device properties that, will, that are most sensitive to the overall system uh, performance. That also provides device guys with sort of the roadmap or direction with where to go. And so we plot here the waveguide loss and through loss that were to us the most sensitive components. And you can see sort of the optical power contours uh, uh, versus these numbers. And two watts is sort of the acceptable optical power level that we expect. And that also results in a certain area overhead in the system. If your optical device performance is worse, you have to basically have less wavelengths per waveguide because you earlier hit the nonlinearity limits or the total optical power in the waveguide, and then your number of waveguides has to increase, increasing the, the, the area overhead. Remember, we're monolithic, so every percent counts. I'm showing here that you can have 80 terabits per second uh, network to memory with less than 5% overall area penalty. Now, if you compare that uh, mapping, which what I mentioned, one of our previous publications where we used heavily, uh, uh, heavy ring uh, waveguide crossings and ring matrices to do the routing, uh, we essentially, uh, first of all, put almost an order of magnitude bigger uh, uh, constraint on our photonic device performance, but we also grow the thermal, uh, the thermal budget. So you have to be careful what you do. Now, you always put this with some type of architectural simulator to tell you what the benefits are. So what I'm showing here is sort of the typical network curves of bandwidth, offered bandwidth versus latency and, and the total power versus uh, bandwidth. This captures this network utilization that I've talked about earlier, how well you're utilizing the photonic links. So we're here showing the electrical case where uh, the interesting uh, point is that if you basically are only one group, just large mesh, you're mostly dominated by the bisection bandwidth of that mesh, even though I.O. is very expensive. So you have to start basically uh, over-provisioning the mesh to provide wider bisection bandwidth because of the congestion in the mesh so that you can match the, the I.O. bandwidth and sort of rebalance. So once you do that, you, that's kind of the best you can do uh, here, uh, so you do grouping and the over-provisioning. You do grouping to shrink the mesh size locally. So that's kind of a normalized to one kilobit uh, per cycle. And then if you do photonics, basically uh, with 16 groups pushes you up by a factor of uh, 8 to 10. One also nice thing with, with grouping is, and this hybrid, keeping, keeping photonics simple, is that your uh, zero load uh, power is actually not that because most of the time, for, some, for most of the apps, there will be you know, lots of idle times, and you don't want that power to be uh, very high. So similar to sort of the, the, the concept of the macro chip, but sort of maybe in a smaller uh, kind of form factor, uh, we, we kind of extend this uh, into sort of the many socket or four socket, eight socket uh, concept, how you would be able to communicate with memory uh, in that way. And the idea is that you basically have smaller clusters of cores, or what we call groups, from which you will go out immediately on photonics to shared L2 somewhere in the system, and then uh, the associated memory controller. And then there will be a separate uh, photonic link between the memory controller and DRAM that I want to talk about. Through this, you basically get a point-to-point -point connection from any socket to any other socket's L2 with same very predictable latency. And because bandwidth density is cheap, you can do this. You're, you're basically just replicating uh, uh, your photonics. Uh, now, this is a, a little bit more detail about that. And now, in the next, what I'm going to talk about is this link over here, which basically gives you, again, the access from the memory controller directly into the memory. So far, we, we talked about, okay, how do you get out of the chip 
to access somebody else's memory controller or the L2 on another socket. Uh, now we're going to talk about how you actually go all the way uh, to the memory because from the board level, that piece uh, is also very important. So if we basically take a look at that connection, we're now talking from the memory controller all the way into the DRAM chip. And how, how we do that? Uh, well, with the electrical, the pin bandwidth is the problem. Um, the IO energy is the problem, as well as in the DRAM chip, the cross chip energy. And in part, uh, once you sort of optimize all these pieces, uh, also part of the activation energy. Just keep in mind, the DRAM bandwidth is now very small. Um, and you ha have to activate between 8 and 16 chips to get the whole cache line out of the DIM. Therefore, your page size compared to sort of the width of the cache line, uh, that ratio is sort of 100 to 1 or so telling you how inefficient you are to really get all the data that gets loaded in the sense amplifiers. Uh, so with photonics, uh, we recently had a paper at ISCA that sort of describes these concepts, so to refer people for more detail there. Uh, you can basically now provide very high bandwidth to, uh, to one DRAM chip. So we explore what architectural changes have to be done to now leverage that. Right? So, you can have great bandwidth density and off-chip energy. But now, we, we saw that once we're in the chip, we might as well go the extra mile and basically get closer to the bank itself to, minima, to get rid of some of these electrical losses as well. Uh, and because we have this big bandwidth that we can provide to each DRAM chip, we can also try to explore to localize the page, to shrink the page and localize it in the DRAM chip itself so we don't have to activate several DRAM chips in parallel. Uh, in order to understand what are the costs and overheads, because DRAM is a very cost competitive market, uh, we first have to sort of see what the architecture or internal structure of the DRAM is. So you basically have this uh, memory cell that's organized in a local tile called, uh, in, in our terminology, array core. And the, the, historically, the size of this array core hasn't changed much in years. It's about 256 by 512 or something like that. And maybe 2x larger in each dimension, but it doesn't, and this is really the RC of this tile is really what sets sort of the a bulk of the, of the latency. Uh, you don't want to change this much because then the cost of the peripheral circuits starts skyrocketing with respect to the actual useful memory area and your efficiency drops. So, uh, from this, so when, when the row, row gets activated, all these um, cells basically uh, in a row get loaded uh, into the sense amplifiers, um, but only some of them actually go and get selected. So each of the array cores in the row uh, get activated, but only the ones selected by the column decoder will basically provide bits onto the IO lines that go across. And that's because there's a limited number of this second tier uh, helper flip-flops or sense amplifiers, which actually occupy a reasonably large area. So you don't want to basically grow their number by a very significant amount. So once that happens, so this array block basically uh, sits within the bank, and all the array blocks within the bank get activated, each providing a tiny little piece of the overall uh, request size. And then we have uh, these chips within the rank and then all these chips get activated because each one of them has very narrow bandwidth. And then we have multiple ranks if we want to grow the capacity. But if we try to do that, then the speed on the electrical connections on the rank actually goes down uh, because of the single integrity issues. So to see how really uh, to bring the photonics in, we sort of look at, at the floor plan of each one of these chips. And granted, here we're not really showing you the DDR2 or 3 type uh, floor plan because this is already a tremendously larger bandwidth. So this is more a representative of sort of the GDDR type uh, uh, floor plan. But we're talking about a terabit per second per chip. So, uh, so as was mentioned previously, uh, sometimes the biggest gain is just getting photonics to the chip. And this is really what, what this is. We just run photonics waveguide across the center stripe where the I.O. is, and we get rid of these electrical I.O. gates. We, we leave all the sort of internals of, of the DRAM intact. But Moving, we wanted to explore what happens if we move a little bit more into the, uh, the DRAM. And so what this shows is you couple the light here, you break certain sort of several wavelengths in each one of the vertical columns, and essentially you can drop, 
your data either here or all the way here, cutting the uh, length of the on-chip wire by the amount that you replicate uh, the photonic access point. So in this case, it's two. In this case, it's basically eight times replicated. Now keep in mind, as you're replicating the access point, the number of photonic devices grows, the number of transceiver circuit grows, and the number of uh, the tuning power grows, and all these, uh, you increase the optical losses. So it puts a bigger strain on the quality of the photonic technology. So we wanted to see where the trade-off is. Uh, in addition to this, I mentioned that we want to sort of go from this concept of two chips with very narrow bandwidth to essentially wider bandwidth to the chip, but only one chip activated at a time so we can shrink the page size and get these activation costs. But you'll see that's kind of the last thing you really want to do after you uh, scoop all these costs. Uh, so we created sort of the architectural simulator and we modified the Cacti D, which is sort of the uh, HP-based modeling tool, mostly tied toward em embedded DRAM and SRAM. So we had to sort of pretty much rehack the whole bottom uh, interface of it to really map to sort of some of the more meaningful DRAM uh, infrastructure. So once you do that, you can basically plot the energy pictures versus these various floor plans. And you see, that as you start going just photonics into the chip, you, you get some, some benefits. Uh, and then replicating photonics, you get the largest benefits. But replicating photonics between four and eight X sort of gives you the best can do, after that you start picking up on these side costs of uh, photonic tuning, some fixed replicated power in the transceiver circuits, etc. And this is probably the best case because this is for the very aggressive assumption of what the photonic circuits and components uh, will be even 10 years down the road in, in, in memory technology. So sweet spot is somewhere I would say between two and four for a little bit more conservative technology. Uh, now, notice that sort of the activate power is a very small portion of the power in the electrical case. Uh, even so, if you just bring photonics to the chip. But once you sort of optimize how many access points you have, this activate power starts being a reasonable chunk. And, and then bring, shrinking the page and reading only from one chip basically gives you this last uh, mile uh, in terms of the, of the energy saved. I'd like to reiterate the common conclusion that latency uh, is really irrelevant. And uh, it does matter a little bit on, on chip, because you're better than repeated wires. But that pretty much gets eaten up in any router that you get blocked. So pretty much forget about latency in optics. Uh, I wanted to stress sort of that energy is not the only thing, especially in DRAM. Uh, actually, the efficiency of the area efficiency, the memory uh, cell area compared to the peripheral, Peripherals is very important. Uh, so we just wanted to show that these techniques actually do, don't blow up your um, uh, area efficiency. So um, we show here with four IOs per array core, um, which is sort of if you don't go and minute shrink the page size, we see that essentially bringing photonics in helps you once you bring it in because the, the, uh, you're not bump limited on the IO circuits. You can, you can get a smaller footprint. But then if you start replicating, you basically pretty, much, pretty quickly eat up all, all the advantages because of these uh, undercut trenches you have to do in each column. Now, if you go to 32 IOs per array core, you basically save because you have less array blocks. So you don't have that many vertical columns. So even, so the gains you get from initially going from electrical to optical still remain so you're better in area than electrical even if you replicate photonics a few more times because you don't have as many trenches. Now, another important thing that I wanted to show is that we talked about uh, so far processor to sort of a single memory chip. That's obviously ridiculous because we need much more capacity than that. Maybe in, in PlayStation, we don't for streaming applications, but for any meaningful application, we want lots of memory chips. So how do we do this scale? Uh, the motivation is, we, remember, we want to bypass this limitation of electrical that as we add more capacity, our electrical channel degrades. So we want to signal as fast and as energy efficient regardless of what the capacity is. So as mentioned previously, there's been a so corona example sort of already looked into that, uh, trying to sort of minimize the connectivity costs between sort of the compute chip and the DRAM in this daisy chain type of uh, fashion. However, uh, they were 
they gave too much confidence or trust into the quality of the photonic devices and put really tough specs on this. Notice that here uh, optical loss grows linearly in dB with number of devices you put on a channel. And if these dB are not very small, then that becomes a huge number. Uh, so pretty much if you have the top notch quality photonic devices, maybe you want to try this, but not, not next 10 years. Uh, another approach is to do a split bus. So basically, whatever power you get, you split passively all the photonic uh, laser power to all the, the, the DRAM chips you have. You light up all the channels, both the read and write, and then essentially you let the memory controller just regulate the traffic, modulate these or not. Problem is, power goes linearly with the number of chips you get at best, although you, you get some more insertion losses just due to splitters and stuff. Now, what we were looking at is, because DRAMs are such special structures that are already in a master-slave configuration where memory controller really knows what's going on in the, in the whole uh, subsystem, we might as well use that intelligence to guide the laser light to where it's needed. And so the proposal here is that uh, essentially the memory controller will know which one of the DRAM chips in the rank or in, in that DIM is basically we want to get the data from. Keep in mind, we're getting a cache line from a particular DRAM chip or a subset of DRAM chips. And so it will actively configure the incoming CW laser light to get switched to the appropriate DRAM chip on both the read and write path. So if we adopt that, we're basically growing a little, a little bit more than sort of the basic link cost uh, for the laser, uh, simply because of some insertion losses but not as, as extensively as the, lean, uh, the split bus and the, the daisy chain architectures. And, and you see that pretty much between five and 10 chips, which is you know, between eight and 16 chips, sort of the norm right now in DIMMs, you basically, if you wanna stay below uh, 100 femtojoules per bit, that's kind of the only approach you can take, even with very aggressive photonic device assumptions. So you gotta be really careful how you physically organize this. So with photonics, we can sort of get 10x memory bandwidth for same power, both to go from the core all the way out to the memory controller and from the memory controller uh, into the, the memory itself. And uh, if we arrange the, the multiplexing in such a way, we can get higher capacity uh, without sacrificing bandwidth. Uh, we're area neutral. And potentially this can be easily adapted to other storage technologies, or as, as we go down the, the chain, basically we're getting less and less sort of bandwidth demand out of, out of these uh, things. So really the focus right now is on DRAM. So I'd like to conclude the talk by saying that, I mean, not only in my talk, but in pre previous talks as well, I, I hope you've understood that this is, silicon photonics is not only, uh, any kind of interconnect, it's not only the, the device problem or the circuits problem, we really need to look at the whole uh, stack from the network and system application all the way down. And only this cross-layer design uh, with appropriate design metrics across layers can give us uh, in improvements and brings us where we want to be in improving the, the performance of the systems by some 10 to 20x in the next several years. Uh, we need to be careful to optimize across layers, otherwise the Amdahl's law is gonna kick in. So that's all I have. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to take.